Well, good morning and welcome. So good to see you as we gather this morning to worship here in our fellowship hall. We'll get used to these uh, arrangements and be out here for the next few months while the work in the uh, sanctuary progresses. We'll try to keep you informed of how things are going, post some pictures online and, and give you timetables as they develop and as we understand them. But as we wait out here, what a blessing to have uh, the setup out here. Uh, I went to churches as a young man that were about this size in, in this setup. So uh, what a blessing to have this as uh, another location where we can gather and worship the Lord. So that's what we are going to do here today. Do appreciate the prayers uh, by the church for the Presbytery meeting on Thursday. It went well, thank the Lord, and happy to give all of you an update on that uh, as you're interested. Our clerk does usually put together a summary of everything that happened, and as soon as that's distributed, I'll print it make it available to the congregation. Other announcements pertaining particularly to our church. We'll resume our Sunday school classes next Sunday. We'll meet out here, at least the adult class. We'll, just, we'll combine that for now and meet out here uh, in the Fellowship Hall at 9. The children's <coughs> classes will be downstairs. As the uh, renovation project goes on, our deacons have begun a fund. If you would like to contribute to help offset the cost of the renovations. Again, we're thankful God has provided already what we need, but as you heard Jonathan say last week, there's more projects we'd like to do. Uh, so any funds we can offset will enable us then to keep working on those future projects as this one concludes. So if you would like to give to that, you can do so and designate it to sanctuary renovation. And then speaking of uh, being out here in the Fellowship Hall, the, the piano to my far left against the wall, not the nice one where uh, Nancy is or where Abe is, if you want this piano, you can have it, all right? So speak to a deacon, uh, let them know you would like to have the piano. So you came to church today, we're giving away a piano because you came. So that's there if you'd like the piano. And then lastly, uh, there will be no youth meeting this evening. So youth will we'll meet out here in the Fellowship Hall for worship. Please still come, but we won't have the youth group this evening. All right. We'll take your bulletin and look at the front. Uh, we returned this week to our regular order of worship, so uh, I'll try to guide you through that well so there are no surprises, but everything uh, here printed for us in the bulletins as we worship the Lord today. We'll begin with this responsive reading from John 15, I'll read the regular type, and then you respond, read the verses that are in italics. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. worship the Lord this morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the privilege of gathering together in Jesus' name. Thank you that our gathering doesn't require a particular building or geographical location, Lord. Where your people assemble, there your church is gathered. There Christ is in the midst, and we thank you for that. We do thank you that we can do the sanctuary renovation. We thank you that we have the fellowship hall to meet uh, and while that work is ongoing, we pray that you would bless that work and speed it to its completion. But as we gather to worship you, we call on your name, the great God, the one true and living God. As you read in the opening reading, our Lord Jesus, the true vine, and the Father, the gardener. And we think of the Spirit of God who works too to produce fruit in your people. We call on the name of that one triune God. And ask that you would be pleased to glorify yourself this morning, to be in our midst, to manifest your presence, and to give us grace. We gather to worship you. It is the most important thing we will do as a church this week. And so I pray you'd be glorified in the worship of your people. We come needing grace, and so I pray that you would give grace to your people. Speak a word to us through your word and, and grow us and Change us, comfort and challenge, and do the great work uh, that you do. And as we uh, enter into your presence, as we 
sit now before you, we call on you and pray to you, uh, using the words you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We'll take your hymn books, there should be one in each seat, and turn to hymn number 38. And stand with me as we sing Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Hymn 38, stand with me please. <laughs> Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Father in heaven, again, we thank you for every blessing that you give us. Again, we have a place to meet this morning, even while the primary meeting place is being renovated. We have the funds to pay for it. You provided a committee that's been very hardworking and able to uh, steer us towards this point, and deacons and elders to oversee uh, this work, and a congregation uh, that is excited for the project and that is in support. We thank you for that. Th those are your blessings. We wouldn't hesitate to give thanks for them. We, we wouldn't pretend, well, those are material things, and, and so we shouldn't pay attention to that. It came from your hand. We give you our thanks. So help us then, in thankfulness to you, to remember the mission of the church, strive for peace and purity of the church, to give attention to the kingdom of God, for all these buildings and things are but means to that end, that the saving purpose of God may go forth, that your glory uh, would be made known in the earth. So we thank you for that. You are on the throne guiding that. And we give you our thanks for that mercy and all the mercies you show us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can remain standing and turn to him 254, alas, and did my Savior bleed him 254. As we hear what our Savior commands, we can be made aware of where we can repent before the Lord. Also found a good responsive prayer based on these Beatitudes. We'll use that next Lord's Day. But for now, listen uh, in these words from Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 
Let's pray silently for a moment. Father in heaven, there is so much we could confess based on this passage. Our prayer this morning is that you would discover to us the ways in which we sin against you. Show us where we are not poor in spirit or meek or hungry for righteousness, where we lack <clears throat> mercy and purity in heart. Forgive us for when we don't show mercy to others. Forgive us for when we don't pursue purity of heart and righteousness, when we don't make peace, but rather we make conflict. Forgive us for when uh, perhaps we go through trouble, but it's trouble we've made because of bad actions that has nothing to do with the kingdom of heaven. Or forgive us for when we don't rejoice in our status as Christians, and maybe we're thought a little of by some, and uh, that's a source of shame rather than a source of rejoicing. Lord, forgive us for, for all these sins and more. Lord, forgive us. And again, use your word to discover to us the ways in which we sin against you. Show us those secret sins and help us to be quick to flee them. But thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that these Beatitudes pronounce as well. That for those who repent, for those who believe, for those who trust, for those who enter in at the, at the narrow gate, there is a kingdom of heaven <coughs> to be attained. There is comfort. There is an earthly inheritance coming in the new creation. There is, you satisfy us with righteousness and show us the mercy we need. And one day we will even see God as your children. And there is an eternal vindication coming. It is worth it to persevere in the kingdom of God because of the reward you give. So forgive us of sin and, and make us mindful of that ultimate destination and help us to persevere towards it. And to preach well in such a way that we encourage that, that that is what is put before the people here. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hear God's pardon. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Turn this morning in your Bibles with me to Psalm 89. Psalm 89 this morning in your copy of God's Word. Again, we put them on the chairs. If you need a copy of the scriptures today, if, I, if you need to keep one, if you need a Bible, by all means, take it home with you. Psalm 89 is our focus this morning. I will read verses 1 through 8, and then we have the response to the Word there in your bulletin. Psalm 89, verses 1 through 8. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. The heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. The grass withers and the flowers fall. The word of our God endures forever. Amen. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, again, once again, we come before you, and we ask for your help. We acknowledge that without you, we can do nothing, but with you, all things are possible. So, Lord, bless then today the reading 
and the preaching of your word. Fill me with your spirit and bless the people here. Bless us with ears to hear, eyes to see, faith, to, to believe what we read in this word. For any doubting soul to find comfort and consolation and confidence in your word today. For anything that we see of our sin, to be driven to confess, but to find mercy in the Lord. For where we need wisdom, we want to obey you more. We want to seek the kingdom of God and give us that wisdom through your word. Whatever the need may be, do your work through your word. And we'll give you our praise and thanks. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What's the hardest you've ever cried? Perhaps it was when a loved one died. Perhaps it was when you did something you really regretted. Maybe someone did something hurtful to you, or perhaps you saw something tragic on the news and it greatly moved you. Maybe something in your family, there was a very close encounter with death and despair and it moved you greatly to tears. In Lamentations 1.16, the author, most likely Jeremiah, says, This is why I weep and my eyes overflow with tears. No one is near to comfort me. No one to restore my spirit. My children are destitute because the enemy has prevailed. What moved Jeremiah to these tears? Well, he wrote these words after witnessing the destruction of Babylon at the hands of, excuse me, the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians. And if history tells us anything, it was a very savage, heartbreaking, disturbing Attack. They attacked the city multiple times. They would carry parts of the population into exile. The third time, they laid siege to it, which meant there would have been widespread hunger. And then at the end of that, they came in, killed more, carried more away, burnt the temple to the ground, and destroyed the city walls. And when Jeremiah saw that, the desolation of his people, he sat down and he wept. And Jesus, years later also, he'd do the same thing in anticipation of the destruction coming upon Jerusalem by the Romans, similar levels of savagery and pain and heartbreak. Well, Psalm 89 expresses that kind of grief. The grief God's people experience when they witness devastation come upon the people of God. Now, you have to read more than half of this psalm to understand that. If we had read more, than verses 1 through 8. If we had read all the way up to verse 37 and stopped there, you would have thought this is a psalm celebrating God's faithfulness. Why, why the gloomy introduction? This is all about uh, the faithfulness and goodness of God, his faithfulness to his promises. As we'll see in the psalm, emphasizing the faithfulness is really only the setup for the lament the psalm expresses. As the author looks around and doesn't see God's promises being fulfilled. Well, who is this author, this psalmist? The heading attributes Psalm 89 to Ethan, that's Ethan the Ezraite. He's listed in the same section of 1 Chronicles as Asaph. He's one of these people who works in the temple as a temple singer involved in worship. He's also referred to in 1 Kings 4.31, which reads, Solomon was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan the Ezraite. So apparently this was a man well-known, renowned in Israel for his wisdom and involved in the temple worship. But that, of course, then raises the question, right, well, what background in David's day or Solomon's day would have provoked such grief, such laments. Well, it may have been the split between the northern and the southern kingdom. That would have looked like everything was falling apart when the northern and southern kingdom split uh, after Solomon's death. Maybe Ethan lived long enough to see that day. However, many Bible studies, and this includes conservative studies that, that respect the authenticity, the historicity of Scripture, they think that titles like Asaph and Ethan, those could have been groups started by those men, but groups that continued after their initial day. So groups in the spirit of Asaph and Ethan. And if that's so, it would allow us to read the psalm against the background of the later exile. That would come hundreds of years later in the destruction of Jerusalem. I said a few weeks ago, book Three of the Psalter 
grapples with the horror of the devastation that comes upon God's people. Psalm 89 concludes that book. And so it very clearly expresses this theme. Well, whatever the background, this psalm presents us with a God whose character and promises are sure, but sin and providence makes it appear that they are not. So what do God's people do when his promises don't come to pass? What do we do when the kingdom of God suffers harm? What do you do when tragedy and disruption disrupt your personal life? Psalm 89 asks us, when everything falls apart, what do you trust? So let's go through this psalm. Let's see how that crisis develops and let's see what solutions God gives. Let's we'll start at the beginning where Ethan makes the proclamation in the opening four verses. Here the author establishes the topics. These will dominate the entire psalm. He sets up the themes that will be a key here in the opening verses. He says in verse 1, or he refers here to the Lord's great love and faithfulness. And together, those two terms, they will occur 12 more times in the psalm. And this song, they are part of God's foundational self-description in Exodus 34, 6. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. These are the qualities of God that tell us our relationship with him is permanent. That he has made a covenant with us, he's entered into a relationship <laughs> with us, and it is permanent. The God who makes these promises, he, he makes them as a person who has a deep and enduring commitment to his people. Those are the ideas there in love and faithfulness. God is faithful to his people. And the expression of that faithfulness is stated in verses 3 to 4. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. Here the author refers to the Davidic covenant, where God said, David, one of your sons will rule over Israel forever. Remember, David wanted to build God a house, a temple. God said, David, I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to build you a dynasty, and it will last forever. One of those sons will reign over my people forever. So the, the psalm begins by saying, God has made this promise, and he is faithful to it. Ethan proclaims that. Excuse me. Well, let's skip ahead now, then, to verses 19 to 29, where Ethan elaborates the promises. David, excuse me, Ethan goes on to describe in more detail this promise God made to David and his descendants. Look at verses 19 to 24. That will give you a taste for the section. Once you spoke in a vision to your faithful people, you said, I have bestowed strength on a warrior. I have raised up a young man from among the people. I have found David my servant. With my sacred oil, I have anointed him. My hand will sustain him. Surely my arm will strengthen him. The enemy will not get the better of him. The wicked will not oppress him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down his adversaries. My faithful love will be with him, and through my name, his horn will be exalted. So there's the kind of promise God is making to David and his servants, or excuse me, his descendants. You're going to win. God's going to make sure you reign. And we've been in the Psalms long enough now for us to understand where those kind of promises point to. Ultimately, yes, David would rule over Israel, and that'd be a great benefit to their nation. But ultimately, there would be a king who would come, and the Lord himself would take authority over all the nations of the world. The, the Davidic covenant was going to lead, ultimately, to that universal reign. So God's promises to David reflect his purpose to save sinners from their sin, to put down all of his enemies, the enemies of our souls, and to bring in this reign of righteousness throughout the world. 
Verse 25 reads, I will set his hand over the sea, his right hand over the rivers. That's language that reflects the extent of God's kingdom. Sounds like it goes beyond the borders of Israel, doesn't it? Uh, these promises weren't just viewed as you know, some kind of national possession. The Old Testament authors saw beyond that. And in fact, when the Pharisees and others try to limit those promises just to this one people group who do everything the right way, Jesus said, no, it goes beyond that. My house is a house of prayer for all nations. All of these promises are pointing to God's universal reign, saving sinners from their sin and bringing in his righteousness. That is what these promises are all about. And in fact, God even anticipated that he would overcome sin among the kings themselves, among the Davidic kings. Let's look at uh, the next section, verses 30 to 37, which detail the protection. If you've ever bought a car or entered into a contract, maybe you looked for some protections in that contract. Well, God put some protections in this covenant. Look at verses 30 to 34. If his sons forsake my law and do not follow my statutes, if they violate my decrees and fail to keep my commands, I will punish their sin with the rod. Their iniquity was flogged. But I will not take my love from him, nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have offered. The point of this protection is to contrast how God will deal with David's and his sons versus how he dealt with Saul. How did it go for Saul in his reign? It was a one and done, wasn't it? He disobeyed God and God said, all right, your house will not become a dynasty. But God came to David and said, I'm going to build your dynasty. And even when you and those sons sin, I'll restore you. I'll correct you. And I'll never take my love away from your house. So when we maybe read this psalm and look at the devastation and say, well, this has an easy solution. It was because of sin. Yes, it was. And yet the covenant was supposed to have some protections against that sin. In other words, even if there was discipline, there wouldn't be devastation. Even if there were consequences, God would not abandon the family line. We, we even see that, don't we, when David sins with Bathsheba. God, God doesn't remove him from the throne. Yes, he takes that child, but then Bathsheba has another son. That's the son who becomes the next king, Solomon. So even out of sin comes God's grace. So you've got promises and protections, and that's then what sets up the problem. As we come to verses 38 to 45, if the promises are building a structure, well, these verses are like waves against that structure. Maybe if you've gone on vacation to the beach and built a sandcastle, it might have been the best sandcastle in the world. But if you came back the next day, it was gone. The waves beat against it and it goes away. Well, like waves against the sandcastle, the verbs of this section beat against the promises of the previous section. Listen to verses 38 and 39. But you have rejected. You have spurned. You have been very angry with your anointed one. You have renounced the covenant with your servant and have defiled his crown in the dust. Also, verse 44. You have put an end to his splendor and cast his thrown to the ground. So the promises of God are great, but from the perspective of the psalmist, they appear to have failed. The enemies have come in. They have destroyed God's temple. They have burnt the walls of Jerusalem to the ground. They have imprisoned God's people, carried them away into exile. Friends and loved ones have died, and there is no hope of things improving <coughs> any time soon. So go back to how we began the sermon today. Have you ever had an experience where it felt like everything was falling apart? That God was no longer working for your good, where your ultimate reality was shaken? Have you ever had seasons in which things that God promised appear to have failed? How did you react during that time? Or maybe you're still in that season now. Well, let's look at how the psalmist reacted. And then we can answer the question as to what he trusted. So in verses 46 to 51, we have the petition. And I think it's worth reading in its entirety. Verse 46. 
How long, Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how fleeting is my life, for what futility you have created all humanity. Who can live and not see death? Or who can escape the power of the grave? Lord, where is your former great love, which in your faithfulness you swore to David? Remember, Lord, how your servant has been mocked, how I bear in my heart the taunts of all the nations, the taunts with which your enemies, Lord, have mocked, with which they have mocked every step of your anointing. When faced with this crisis, the psalmist cried out to the Lord. Once you notice first, he acknowledged the problem. He, he didn't go before God and say, all right, you know, let's pretend everything's going okay. He acknowledged the problem. <laughs> How long, Lord, will you hide yourself forever? He asked God, how long is this going to continue? Lord, you're the only one who can do something about this situation. So I want me to see here that this is an expression of faith. He knows who alone can meet the need. That is God. And so that at the same time shapes him to have a reverent approach. He asks how long. He does not ask how dare you. And that's different. He goes to the one who can meet the need. But he does not charge the one who has created the situation. Instead, second, he asks God, what happened to your promises? Verse 49, Lord, where is your former great love? which in your faithfulness you swore to David. God, based on your promises, this is not the way things are supposed to go. And that's what he's basing on God's promises. I don't think he expects God to give people a pass for their sin. If you ever watch any TV show that involves any kind of religious person, they're either crazy or they think, oh, God is just okay with everything. And let's just be positive. I don't think the psalmist expects God to give people a pass for their sin, he acknowledges God has wrath and it's just. He acknowledges our, our mortal lives are futile because we are sinners. So he knows that. He knows that sin has consequences. He knows the people of God have sinned against God. But again, the point of the protections, the point of the promises and the covenant was, okay, they guaranteed that God's promises would continue despite sin. That where sin abounded, grace much more would abound. So why isn't that going according to plan? And so thirdly, he does the only thing he can do. He appeals to God's glory. He appeals to God's care for his people. Verse 50, Lord, remember how your servant has been mocked. How I bear in my heart the taunts of all the nations. God, how does this reflect on you? How does this reflect on your glory, on your care for the people? Remember what Moses would say whenever God said, I'm going to destroy these people and start over again. Moses would say, but what will they say about you in Egypt? That you brought the people out just so you could slay them? Lord, if, if the world is reproaching us, it is of your prerogative to arise and defend yourself. It's, it's too much for us to bear. So when will you arise and act for the sake of of your name. So, so I give this as both an encouragement and a challenge. Is this how you react when hard times come? The psalmist has given us a model here that we can follow. This psalm is not like Job, where the Lord eventually shows up and says, okay, don't talk like that. Now, I'm not saying you always have to go to these depths, but when crisis comes, do you go to the Lord? Do you appeal to his promises? Or do you say, well, this faith thing isn't working out. God isn't doing what he's supposed to do. I'll just try to figure this out myself. Do we make prayer the first and last priority? Do we look to the Lord and do we wait for him to fulfill his promises? Because sometimes they are slow in coming. I also want to mention, not lose sight of the fact that the psalmist's main distress arose because of the state of God's kingdom. He was distressed that God was not working, so to speak, so it appeared, for the good of his kingdom. So I'm not saying you can't apply this to personal problems. I think we should take all of our concerns to the Lord who cares for us. But I do think it is worth asking, okay, 
Do our concerns ever get to the state of God's kingdom? Do we look at the state of God's kingdom and say, that's something I care about? And maybe you look at some parts and you're discouraged. Maybe you look at other parts and you're encouraged. You see where God uh, is at work. Does that become a matter of prayer? Or are we just fixated on the things of this life? Do we care about the state of the church? Do we cry out to God for that? So let's come finally then to the praise. And this is where we're going to go back to the beginning of the psalm. Because this psalm ends and it doesn't give us God's direct answer to these prayers. But I think the psalm has given us enough material at the beginning of the psalm to tell us how to trust while we wait for prayers to be answered. I think what I'm getting at is I think the psalmist already knows the answers to his own questions. And so while he may appeal to the promises of God, look now at the beginning of the psalm where he focuses on the character of God. So look at verses 5 and 6. The heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? God, there is no one like you. And that means that there is no one we need other than you. We can wait on you to fulfill your promises. Because again, you're the only one who can. You're the only one who can do something about this. And it is of your nature to be faithful. It's not just a benefit, it is, but it, it is God's nature to be faithful to his promises. I and mean, isn't that how the psalm began? This confession that God is loyal, God is faithful, and circumstances. Don't change that. God transcends every circumstance. The emphasis continues in verses 9 and 11, where the psalmist celebrates God's power in creation. And providence. Verse 9, you rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. Verse 11, the heavens are yours and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. God, you established the world. God, you sustain the earth. And that means nothing in heaven, earth, and hell can thwart God's promises. And the emphasis, by the way, here on creation reminds us God is not only Israel's God. He is the creator and controller of the whole world. So those promises for universal righteousness, God cares about it. It's part of what he's doing in this theater that he has made for his glory. And lastly, verse 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. We mentioned those two attributes, love and faithfulness. We mentioned at the beginning of the psalm, why? They're the foundation of God's promises to Israel. Well, guess what? They are the foundation of who God himself is. If love and faithfulness establish Israel's throne, love and faithfulness establish God's kingship. And eventually, he is the real king, isn't he? And what this means, church, then, is we trust in God to fulfill his promises because that's who he is. That's what he does. He is faithfulness and righteousness. He creates and sustains. So he promises to say he will fulfill those promises. And so when sin and providence make it appear that God's character, that his promises are not sure, then here's what you do. You petition him and then you rest in his attributes. You rest in his person and promises. And we can do this. We can praise God while we wait for him then to act. Verse 15 reads, Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. Acclaim, it's the idea of a festal shout. Here, celebrating the idea that God controls the world. So, so this psalmist, despite the difficulty, says, all right, you know who's blessed? Those who learn to shout your praises, even while they wait for your promises to be fulfilled. Because again, that's who you are. 
And so I commend to you, believers, friends, take time to meditate on the attributes and the works of God. Learn what your God is like. Do, do it in trial. Do it before you get there to prepare you for that. And that's one of the benefits of the Lord's Day. That's why you're here this morning. Thank the Lord. And that's what you have this whole day for. Time that God gives you to rest. And to use some of that time to read His Word. Spend time in His presence. Adore who He is. Be strengthened in your faith. And here's the last reason, by the way, we know that God's promises are true. Because Christ, the true King, He suffered the exile and the tribulation due His people. So they could be saved. The question towards the end of the psalm, how long will your wrath endure? We know it endured on his son until his son said, it is finished. And now that risen king, who we don't yet see, he promises the gates of hell will not prevail against his church and kingdom. So let us love that kingdom. Let's trust and appeal to those promises and let's praise that Lord forever. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of the Son. We come to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you that you are reliable. And so I pray this morning as we go out, again, whatever the, whatever the particular spiritual need might be, I pray that we would go out rejoicing in you, trusting you. Give grace to your people. Give grace to those who are weary, who are waiting upon the Lord. Give grace to those who are before you, seeking you to meet particular needs. Give grace to this church to seek first your kingdom. Thank you that you are faithful and reliable. Thank you for all your mercies. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's celebrate that faithfulness. Let's give our thanks to God. By singing hymn 94, How Firm a Foundation. We'll just sing verses 1 through 4. You can stand with me. Hymn 94, verses 1 to 4.